Okay. Um, so I agree that we humans need to express feeling in order to survive and that feeling is basically our response to an emotion uh, that we experience in a situation repeatedly. Uh, by following and acknowledging our feelings, we are in a sense becoming wiser to what can cause trauma or how to react in a situation. And for instance, if one were to always get left out at a party, they would grow a distaste or an inclination not to go rather than one who has fun and thrives in the middle. Um, and I agree that our mind in our mind situations are imprinted and it creates an idea that promotes these uh, certain feelings. With that, I can see, I can kind of see what Damasio means by everything not being free and random because it all goes back to everything being cause and effect. Uh, we, not, we might not see it, but because of something that happened in the past, things are the way that they are now and it's not just uh, faith or God, excuse me. And I think that we are born in a sense of how to live, um, like how babies know how to suckle or how they know how to swim when they're just born or simple things like that. And it's kind of like instinct, We like when we're developing in the moon, in the womb and uh, moving around, we're working our muscles and practicing for, you know, how we could survive. And as we grow, we're just developing on that idea more and more. Um, and then I also agreed that, let's see, I also saw where they were talking about how today we are detached from the natural world. Um, I believe, especially around my generation and down, we do have a lot more mental health issues because of technology. Not only is it or can it isolate us from the rest of the world, but it can also connect us to the side of the internet that promotes depression or sadness. Um, I know there have been plenty of times where I got on YouTube just to check out a simple animation video. And I went down this wormhole of short stories that go progress that got progressively uh, sadder. And then if anyone knows YouTube and well, pretty much all of the web, it memorizes what you do. So now half of my uh, recommended videos are sad or, you know, somewhere around that. And I feel like that just helps enable that feeling. Um, and then there was the mention of how drugs plays a big role in our state of mind. And I agree that in America we do, especially now, or we are getting more and more um what is it you see idea of taking drugs or um coming up with excuses to take drugs and you might get prescribed some pills from a doctor uh for a headache or appointment or something and then they often talk about how you get you can get addicted from that and I know I've always been told don't take what the doctor recommends uh you're supposed to take like a little bit less otherwise you can become addicted so I feel like it's all, again, that kind of goes back to what we were saying about greed corrupting everything because we're just going to get addicted and then we're going to have to go to rehab and then we're going to just have to pay more and more money to these things. And it's just a cycle, you know, and for some people, they can get trapped in that cycle that it's really hard to break uh, once you get in it. If that makes sense. I'm not really sure if that's what he was trying to say, but that's what I got from it. Actually, the irony is, here's the overall irony. And I, I think I've, everything we've talked about, right? I've said, but it could be corrupted, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember how we had Seneca was stoicism, strength of mind? And mm -hmm. then we had the article about how Reddit uses it for this very misogynist project. Do you remember that? Strength yeah. of mind meant being a man and keeping a woman in place because she really does want to depend on you. Do you remember that? Yeah, but it's really just how they thought in that time. Right, so there's stoicism 
and then there's the corrupt perversion of it, right? You take the, mm -hmm. you take, I mean, even then it's, it's an interpretation of stoicism or an application that is pretty self-interested, you know? Mm -hmm. um, then there was Augustine, the eternal and the temporal. And then that woman said, I would never raise my kids like that. It just makes you hate your body. So we're, we're still in that, right? Does mm -hmm. that make sense? When Damasio says yeah. the dualism, okay. Then we had Augustine who tried to link Aristotle. Aristotle had a biological view of flourishing. Actually, Mr. Damasio likes Aristotle, <laughs> okay? Ah, like these guys, right? They rip everything apart like Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> and then they try to like glue it back together. <laughs> and they're not very good at it is what I think. But anyway they're gluing it back together uh with their own twist on it uh, definitely right so <laughs> thomas aquinas is gluing it back you know but he's he's connecting it to jesus christ right mm -hmm. so we had the theological virtues our faith hope and charity and then the rational virtues our wisdom temperance courage all that wonderful stuff well then that turned into don't use artificial birth control. Um, and if you have more kids than you can afford, that's okay. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you're sitting up there taking care of, you know, you got all the food and shelter you need. Uh, don't but have to you know, worry about it. Yeah, you go tell a bunch of poor people don't use birth control. And it's just, I mean, so it seems to me we're kind of back where we started it yeah i can imagine having a kid right now i feel like it would be really a struggle financially and i would be extremely depressed on how how could i raise this you know child and give it a successful start especially knowing that they remember all of this and it could affect them yeah that's that's right and so anyway you had this theory that the Catholics were going to affirm biology and natural reason, but add uh, faith. And faith meant no disordered acts. And so on the basis of the natural goal of intercourse is procreation, you have to be open to it. Well, the, as a matter of fact, it ends up with poor people having more kids than they can afford, right? Mm -hmm. And the church will just tell them that's okay, you know, you can keep your faith. And so I think that's dualistic again, right? You're just telling them, don't think that much about this life, <laughs> right? But, mm -hmm. you know, your kids are traumatized by it, right? Um, if you also know what we've read recently, that everything imprints in the mind of a child, you know, what's a mother going to do if she, I mean, okay, so I knew this woman, they have the Women's Violence Shelter Day, and they usually have a, just an event and a woman will testify. Well, this woman had an abusive dad. And, and she told her, then this guy starts, you know, wanting her to marry him or whatever. And she says to her dad, I'm out of here. And her dad says, it's going to be even worse. So there. Mm -hmm. And this guy abused her because they can suspect, right? It's like a predator-prey relationship. Mm -hmm. They can smell it. They could just tell a woman who... Uh, vulnerable yeah. right that they can control well he had a daughter and somehow he had custody of that daughter and so this guy brought in his friends and they they gang raped her mm. like he offered her to his friends but she didn't say anything because the little girl was in the other room mm. and she didn't want to leave him because she wouldn't be able to get custody of that little girl so would she 
would that be good for her to have a child as a product of that gang rape? Mm -hmm. I'd be, you know, I mean, can't you, just, I mean, can't you just let a woman choose and say, as far as I know, I'd rather risk going to hell than have to bring a child into the situation. Mm -hmm. That Especially if she feels like she has to stay with him in right. order to raise that child. So that that's, means that that, that child was... might be in that situation. Right. I mean, it just seems to me, why don't you leave it up to the woman? It's going to be hard mm -hmm. enough. But they don't. You know, <laughs> They're telling you what to do all the time. Drives me nuts. But anyway, so you've got you've got the claim that it's not dualistic, but it is dualistic, right? It's mm -hmm. not the best judgment in a lot of situations. Um, and then you resort to faith, right? Um, so that's do you understand what I'm saying? There it the yeah. Saint Thomas you know, in theory, but then in reality, we're back to dualism. <laughs> and then, then we had that switch to the modern world. So then we had modern science, Newtonian mechanics, and that split into the blank slate psyche. And um, we're going to use social science, we're going to redesign the psyche. And so this was entirely new, right? Aristotle didn't think that. Seneca, this is a complete rejection of the ancients among the empiricists that are going to design people so that they're happy. You follow that? Yeah. And then the dualists, Descartes and Kant, are right back to that huge split, right? But now it's split in the name of reason, whereas Aristotle's reason was natural. It wasn't split. So now you have dualism. And then you had that reductionism. So you had John Locke writes, you know, I have a right to this and a right to that. And it's so abstract. It's, <laughs> it's not about real people, right? It's, mm -hmm. Again, a woman's pregnant. Well, I have a right to my body. You know, it's not like she's fighting for her rights against this, this thing inside of her is trying to take her rights. You know, that's not mm -hmm. the way women experience that, <laughs> right? It, it's just so when you design a society around an abstraction like that, of course, you're going to get trouble. I have a right to, well, then John Locke had a very minimal government. It was only military and police. So there's no right to education. There's no right to healthcare. There's no right to whatever. But societies change and people need this just to, to get along. So that's not working very well. Then you had the empiricists. And, and you remember them, they say, look, it's pleasure and pain. Everything's about pleasure and pain. So they were the ones that really wanted to socially engineer things. Um, you remember Bentham? You remember Mill? Bentham, that was the, yeah, Bentham and Mill. Yeah, and so the, these, Mill was raised in this very, very controlled environment. And um, he was hit by his dad. He was raised to be to be smart because his dad wanted to prove to the his opponents that intelligence is socially constructed. It's not natural. It's socially constructed. So he's going to raise his kid to be smart. Well, he did have one of the highest recorded IQs, <laughs> but um, it it drove him crazy too. <laughs> anyway, so. Then John Stuart Mill has the higher pleasures and the lower pleasures, right? The pleasures of intellect. Well, that's what he was raised with. But you have to raise kids. He understands this, that you have to raise your kids to seek the higher pleasures. So what if you don't? Well, then 
society's responsible for having all these immature adults, but he doesn't really solve the problem. He just says, if you get these enlightened people like him to start children outright, okay. The trouble is, if, if you want a free and open society, you have to have all adults who are mature. See, it only works if there's mature adults. Mm -hmm. How do you get them? <laughs> well, you have to go knock on the doors of people who are not raising their children properly and say, I'm sorry, but I want a free and open society. So I'm going to take your child away from you so that they'll be raised to seek the higher pleasures and we can have a free and open society. <laughs> Does that go? They're not going to do that. What? I said they're not going to do that, though. Well, I mean, they're not going to think that that's a free society, uh -huh. right? But these guys, Because we right? have the way to raise our children however we want to. Right. But OK, so now you have Mr. Von der Koop talking about trauma, and it does really matter, right, how kids grow mm -hmm. up and that they don't get traumatized. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so now we have all these, you know, techniques. And the thing about him is that we still try going back to that model of social engineering, right? Um, so von der Koch mm -hmm. says that the, we still have this leftover stuff from the Enlightenment that all of our science is going to develop these pills that are going to be able to, do you remember that the psychiatric, the American Psychology Association has that diagnostic manual. It just mm -hmm. looks at behaviors and then it tries to change the environment to get different outside stimulus and then it will change the behavior, right? Or you take a pill to change the brain chemistry, and then you change the environment, and then you're going to be able to control behavior, and you're going to be able to make everybody happy. And Mr. Von der Koop says no, <laughs> right? Are you, is this making sense to you? Yes. Okay. So he's, and then he's bringing in the profit motive, right? That the, the, Psychology Association makes a lot of money on those diagnostic manuals, right? And they get volume one and two and three and four. And you know, every time they come up with a new one, they make gobs of money. And so he's suspicious of that. Um, and then, and the Enlightenment thinkers did not anticipate that. We're going to raise everybody to want to be middle class. They didn't think about how all that science, social science, technology, new drugs, health, mental health. They, I mean, at, early on, they thought, wow, we've got this. Like, we are going to create a perfect society. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't anticipate that it, it would be corrupted by greed or it'd be corrupted by military you know, that you can appeal to people's fears and make a ton of money selling weapons and make money going to war. That's all that's related to greed, but you have to appeal to fear. And so that you would literally use all the same techniques that the enlightenment people assumed would be used to create this wonderful middle class. And you would use it to create a wealthy class and to go to war for oil, right, for money, they did not anticipate the abuse. Um, but Mr. Von der Koch, so what is he bringing into the conversation? He's bringing in that, yes, the mind uh, is vulnerable and it needs, but it needs community, right? You need good parents, you need good extended family, you need good education, and you need theater, and you need recess 
You need joyful engagement, he says, right? You need um, music, uh, the arts. You need that, but you need it in a community setting. And that gives you strength, right? And it gives you a happy life. And mm -hmm. so trauma is not the norm. And then you can help people work through a trauma. But if you raise kids in toxic environments, right? In environments where violence is all around them, where the people who take care of them are either violent themselves or they're always afraid of vulnerability. And so the child will either grow up afraid or they'll grow up having been treated violently. And that mm -hmm. is a deep trauma. And then you remember, sometimes what's called bad behavior is just the kid trying to survive. So yeah, the, it's yeah, just you can't the just only way they know how to act out. All right. So the, the main takeaway with Von der Kolk was we've got all these enlightenment, you know, we've got all these assumptions that behavior will do. No. No, that was an illusion of the Enlightenment. And then Mr. Um, Glenn Hedges talks about the corruption of the psychology. You read that, didn't you? Did I sign that? Yeah, yeah the illusion of happiness. Okay, so, so we've got that. Now, this time, we have Damasio. He also, in neuroscience, so Mr. Van der Kolk talks about neuroscience. Remember that? And you can really get those what are electrodes on your brain and train yourself. The person trains mm -hmm. themselves to watch so that the brain waves actually get better, right? Is that do you remember yeah. that? Okay, so so he's trying to work that out, but Mr. Vonderkoot keeps saying you have to have community, you have to have the arts, you have to have bonding. The whole thing is about attachment theory, right? Kids have to have an attachment to at least one adult that is playing their role of, of God, basically, or of a flourishing life, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. But they have to have that. They're not going to make it. Or it's going to be a long haul to help them unearth the trauma and heal the trauma. Okay, so Mr. Damasio comes along with his neuroscience, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, yeah, the enlightenment point of view has been empirically proven to be wrong. Like, okay. <laughs> I mean, as an Aristotle scholar, it's just like, really? Really? All right, whatever. You know, you're the authority. I'm an idiot over here. Nobody listens to me. Okay. So, Mr. Damasio, what do you say? Well, he says that dualism is wrong. Yay. That reductionism is wrong. Bravo. Okay. <laughs> so, what do we have? We have these body state maps, right? That's what you were talking about, Ivy. We have these mm -hmm. deep seated maps that developed over the course of evolution. It's very much an evolution-based model, right? He just assumes that you'll accept evolution. So yeah, we learned how to babies, but I mean, way back while we were evolving, we clearly learned how to breathe, you know, the breathing mechanism, the breathing system of the brain, the circulatory mm -hmm. system of the brain, the digestive system, you know, all that stuff evolved and it evolved in relationship to the other systems and the outside world, right? You're all adapting, fitting, constantly moving toward higher and higher level of complexity. And then you get, so the complexity is in the form of a body state map, right? So this mapping, this neural mapping is going on and you're getting attached to the outside world getting attached to people and these maps are getting more and more complex. Okay, and then he says at a certain point, the maps became complex enough 
that you made this leap into realizing that there's patterns out there and you start getting ideas, right? And so you start acting on the basis of ideas because you become consciously aware that you have this consciousness that you can talk about stuff that you can change behavior based on talking, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. And then you start, so then you become a creature of culture, right? And so at a certain point, we are cultural creatures and these more recently formed neural maps formed as a result of culture. So we inherited that culture, which I've been teaching you about, right? That mm -hmm. culture isn't just a bunch of stories about people. It's stories about how our neural mapping got formed. And so how, what kinds of values we've had in the past, how we've talked about that, how we've justified what we did on the basis of those ideas. And then he's saying, we have to change our ideas, right? Like the idea of dualism was wrong and it causes dysfunction, right? It, it's, mm -hmm. it's a kind of neural map that's not adaptive, right? It prevents us from homeostasis. So homeostasis mm -hmm. is where we've got this perfect sort of connection at a high level of interacting with people, a high level of sustainability and um, an inner harmony, right? So, hi, Warren. Uh, so I'm telling Ivy, okay, so Warren, I'm, I'm in the middle of a story about okay. everything we've done. And so you can go back. I remember to record it, um, but we just okay. have gotten to the reading for today. Yes, so, that's, that's okay. okay. So Mr. Damasio has rejected the dualism of the enlightenment, Kant and Descartes, right? He says there's empirical evidence that that's wrong. Um, and he's rejected the reductionism. And now he's talking about when we, when we thought that way, our neural mapping, our more recent neural mapping that's based on ideas was not adaptive, right? It was maladaptive. These are the wrong ideas. And so now he's trying to teach us the ideas that will enable us to be truly adaptive. And to be adaptive, his goal is homeostasis, this internal, external, you know, everything is harmonized. And his thing was that emotions are very much a part of your neural mapping. And you have to map, the maps include this huge nexus of actions, emotions, and thoughts. And so you don't split your thoughts off from your emotions, that's dualism. And you don't just have emotions and just react. You can actually have this goal of homeostasis and you can start forming neural mapping based on ideas that is gonna lead you to that goal. So his, his language is that when you have a, something in the outside world, like you get hit by a car, right? And you and everybody around you has an emotion, right? Ah, right? <laughs> but then it gets in your brain and it starts getting processed. It starts getting linked to some kind of reflection. And that's a feeling, right? So feelings occur not long after the emotion your your body your mapping starts to try and digest it and so give it meaning right interpret it and it is amazing how this happens because you get hit by a car somebody's first thought might be who the hell is that driver you know or somebody's thought is get this person to the hospital or who's the mother we got to call it you know what i mean People go there, but those are feelings, right? Because they're different. They're not the data from outside. They're instantly mapped on to the way people experience the world. Does everybody understand that? Yes. 
it's common sense, really. It's just that it is shocking when I'm sure this has happened to you. There's some event happening mm-hmm. and everybody interprets it differently. And it's like, wait. <laughs> anyway, but he's saying that some neural maps are actually better than others. But he is saying that feelings, that's what he calls feelings. You cannot let go of them. They are inseparable from your mind, your thoughts. And some are better than others. And ultimately you want homeostasis. So um, what he, when he talks about Spinoza, um, I want to make sure I get this in the right order. But, okay, so his first step is that feeling, excuse me, really matter. Spinoza and the ultimate goal is a kind of microcosm in the macrocosm. You want a set of neural maps that is completely adaptive to the environment. And so he's saying that the more complex our society gets in a, in a highly technological age, that these more and more, um, the neural maps that we need are related to, first of all, the golden rule, treat other people as you want to be treated. So you need, he said, that's not from a prophet speaking for some weird God, that's literally in the mapping in your brain. Like we are wired to get along with each other, to cooperate. And when we don't, we destroy. Everybody's homeostasis is destroyed. So he says, if there's evidence, there's empirical evidence for the legitimacy of the golden rule. And he thinks it's really important, right? Because it's not based on religion. It's not based on some weird, you know, you pull it out of the sky and say, well, that's my faith. He said, no, I mean, this is natural reason, natural faith, right? Faith based on reason. Okay, so then the golden rule. Then you go from that to international, to national laws, right? Following the rule of law in your country. Then you go from that to international organizations like the UN, the WHO, and more and more you expand your neural maps in order to have empathy. You have empathy with other people, like we're all basically the same. And so if you treat everyone the way you wanna be treated, you can achieve homeostasis. Um, All right. And then um, I'll stop there for a minute. And then Warren, you can start with what you wanted to come to class with. What was your reaction to the reading? Um, I'm not gonna read off, cause I, I know I'm already late and we're cramped for time. I'm not gonna read off of the regular document, but what I started out to say was with, um, this this person that we're interacting with i think by far he's probably i would say probably my favorite individual just the way how he articulates himself and his thoughts and the things he say and how he says them like um the thing with emotion and the whole neurological maps what i what i um involved in my reading was i made a it's not really a metaphor i would say to say he kind of describes that our mind to achieve hold on wait 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 let me just go for the document instead because it's gonna be too much i said okay here we go i'm starting over the first thing that stood out to me that demasio gave i'm saying his name right right yeah fine with me yeah gave a definition of feeling that i have never heard before so this should be interesting he defined feeling as the expression of the, of human flourishing or human distress as they occur in the mind and body. Interacting with um, chapter two, I realized that Demacio is highly and sensibly educated based on how the, he structures his definitions and a easy path 
can be seen on how the previous readings on our thoughts and how we interact with them. This research is basically telling us that we as adult humans have the ability to see what our thoughts are and examine them because our ideas control who we are. Ultimately, we have the control of who we are or what we become. So basically saying being intact with our thoughts is very important because at the end of the day, we do what we think, if that makes sense. And we think what we feel also. Yeah, exactly. And to be able to express the right things to get the desired outcome, we have to be intact with the emotions. We have to be experiencing feelings. And I said, it is our responsibility to play the role of accountability. The Masio not all not only gives us a definition of feelings, he also tells us what they do and their importance. It is said that we need to experience feelings as they allow us to solve various issues. I agree with this statement in the sense that feelings are what motivates or demotivates us as people. In order to solve a problem, one must be driven whether in extrinsically or in intrinsically to solve the problem and get the desired result. The same goes for not solving the problem. The feeling we have towards the issue determines what we do with it, solve it or avoid it. We have been introduced to multiple philosophers or, and psychologists during this course and not many of them link the body and the mind together as he does. Some separate them, which, uh, some separate them, which most do, but Damasio links them both together, which is another reason he stands out to me. The mind is the most powerful place. It is like the treasure and at the end of the, oh, it is like the treasure at the end of the rainbow and with every treasure, there is a map involved to get to said treasure. And Damasio tells us the maps involved in the process, meaning the neurological um, maps that you were just talking about. So the reason why I said that is um, he's basically saying, well, I basically deduced from it was that he's trying to get us um, involved. He's trying to tell us what our mind is about and the different, different um, routes, um, routes we have to take in order to get to the mind. Then I said, Damasio mentions Aristotle as he agrees with him on the basis that emotions are said to be rational in the sense that the outcome that they cause are beneficial to the individual displaying the emotion. Um, usually when someone hears rational, they're, think, or they're thinking or of like people doing things that make sense and like moralistic values and stuff. But rational in this sense is basically doing what would benefit the individual. Then he speaks on cooperative behavior. If done, it is said to have the human in a better state as it triggers the usage of regions of the brain which releases dopamine, which is also known as the feel-good hormone. If one has increased level of dopamine in their body, it influences their feelings and behaviors, causes them to, causing them to emit good emotions, which in turn cause them to produce feelings that are beneficial to them Hence, why the nature of rationality. Beneficial to everyone, right? The golden yes. rule. Yes. Yeah. It's, you don't separate what's beneficial to me from what's beneficial to everyone. That would yeah. be if you really had mature feelings, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Oh, Ivy. <laughs> I can't get three people in one class. It's really pretty crazy, but. Anyway, I mean, all of you have interesting things to say. Um, so we will, we will proceed. Um, so let me do a screen share for a sec, Warren. Yes. And then um, Ivy can, of course, come back into the screen share. I mean, into the, um, huh, the video, right? Eventually, all of you will get the information, but it's nice to have you around. <laughs> um, let me go to the outline here. Um, and what, what I'm really looking forward to is next time on Friday, because what I wanna talk about today is why you're excited about it, what's good about it. And then he completely blows it, I think. Like, I think he completely undermines his own position. And that's why I wrote my book. It's just like, wait a sec. Um, so anyway, because so far, 
it does sound like Aristotle, doesn't it? That yes. Aristotle was a biologist and he said the most important thing in childhood habituation is to get kids to feel pleasure in doing what's noble, right? And so, and that to me, that's all of Greek culture is all those horrible tragedies and everything. What they're about is for you to admit you've got a really dark side. And if you get in a situation, it could trigger you and you could do some really horrible stuff. And so if you empathize, right? So empathy isn't just touchy-feely, nice feelings. Uh -huh. it's, I have a capacity for evil and I need to know that I have it and I need to recognize critical moments which would trigger it so that if it happens, I'll remember that tragedy and I'll go, no, don't do that. That was Agamemnon, don't do that, right? Yes. And so, okay. And then on the other hand, with the positive. So every tragedy has a character that represents good judgment, right? So, so that's always, you, you have your image of who you want to aspire to, and you have your image of all the ways you could go wrong. And so if that's how they did the education is that they didn't just lecture you, right? They, they allowed your imagination to just go and imagine being this powerful guy that's so macho. And then he does all this damage and you go, oh, I guess I don't want to be that guy. He's, he's a jerk, right? And so my claim is that the Greeks get that that they wanted all that neural mapping and all those emotions and your imagination. They wanted to get you totally engaged so that you would break the neural mapping that would make you want to take revenge. Does that make sense, Warren? Yes. Okay. So that's why I was motivated to write this book. Okay. So he says, you know, um, that we've discovered there's this close connection inseparable between feelings and thoughts. And I'm going, okay, okay. I've been writing about that for 30 years. Um, and then, I mean, just get this, the struggle for balance. Hello, balance. <laughs> That's the old Aristotelian, right? Mean between extremes. Did that click for you when you read that? Yes, it sounded familiar to me. Okay, so body state maps, there's all the ones that evolved, breathing, digestion, all that stuff. We're not, we don't have any control over that stuff. Then there's the more complicated stuff that evolved more recently. Then your, your own autobiographical self, what you remember. Um, and then there's actually what you experienced is one thing. And then what you remember is often different right yes. because yeah everybody has a different mind through which they're filtering this stuff um uh, but you can um part of therapy as we discussed with von der Koch, is that people block out their trauma but it affects their behavior so they have to try to re they have to change their autobiographical self in order to get to those wounds, right? And heal those wounds. Um, <clears throat> so the fact that he's saying mind, right? Body, brain, and mind, and feelings and thoughts are inseparable. Um, there's some things where we have the same mental images, um, and that would be, um, uh, I mean, I guess, you know, just the standard stuff that we basically agree on, that buildings, you know, what a building is, what a street is, things like that. But um, the, okay, in this transition, the mind reflects on the image, and then you get the idea of an idea. That's your highest level of neural mapping. And that's what changes by studying ideas and philosophy and all that stuff, right? That's why I think philosophy is important, not because it's a disembodied mind, 
but because it's actually changing your neural maps. And so your parents had to have a certain idea of the good when they raised you and they decided when to nurture you and when to yell at you and what to have you be doing. I mean, parents think about that stuff all the time. I'm around my grandkids, you know, and my kids and their spouses, they're always uh, very aware of this. Um, so the mind, okay. The self is a second order idea, right? Over and above any sort of experiences, you get this idea of yourself. Um, the goal is homeostasis. Everybody wants to preserve themselves. You have to realize that there's no gap between preserving yourself and preserving other people. There's no gap at all. You just figure it out. Um, harming others harms ourselves. We're wired to cooperate. Um, okay, and so then it's a cross-disciplinary approach to the study of human beings, integrated knowledge. So this is a critique of the academy that's gotten way too over-specialized. So he says we have to have a we have to relook at all these disciplines, and and especially the humanities. And so, in my book, I say, yeah, well, I'm. This is my answer to his invitation, right? That I want us to relook at Greek culture and show that it actually had that view uh, all along. It's just that people didn't see it because they brought with them all their ideas and kept projecting that onto the Greeks. Um, then there's human salvation is that kind of homeostasis. You have to seek joy and minimize sorrow. And then um, not to please some sort of God who's going to judge you, but to live in conformity with the nature of, you could call it God, or you could just call it the universe, right? All that really matters is that for us to flourish, we have to treat each other well. We have to treat nature well, right? The meaning of life is the desire to understand. Now, um, what I disagree with him on, which we'll get to next time, is why he thinks death is evil <laughs> and nature is cruel. That, that doesn't fit and it doesn't fit with Spinoza at all like part of wisdom is to accept death and not to fight it because somebody else gets a chance to live uh, I don't understand that at all and I don't understand why he thinks nature is cruel <laughs> oh my gosh that that is completely inconsistent with if you want homeostasis you recognize this is my nature this is my place in the universe. And the meaning is to understand it and to pass on a world to the next generation so that my children can have homeostasis, my grandchildren can have homeostasis, and I will accept death because I don't want to fight it because that'll use a bunch of resources. And then my children and grandchildren don't have those resources. Um, does that make sense to you, Warren? Yes, yes. It's basically okay. looking out looking out for the generation to come. And why isn't that really what naturally follows? You know, if do you see I what I mean? You, what? As I as I said um a few weeks ago, and it's been my talking point for a while now, we as human beings are very selfish and we can't be pleased. But except that he says, no, you know, he says, if you really want to be enlightened, there's no gap between you and other people, right? Yes. Which is what I've been saying, right? Mm -hmm. And so resorting to selfishness just means that you're going to traumatize people. You're yes. going to get traumatized. Mm -hmm. And that's very psychologically unhealthy. And it's very self-destructive and it destroys societies, right? When people get selfish, the whole society goes down. That would that's what Homer is about. That's what tragedy is about. But anyway, um, Damasio, that's what Damasio is saying. No, 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 no. You know, we're wired to cooperate. The 
and in our evolution, the, the people that cooperated lasted longer. The ones that were selfish died off, right? So literally evolution has selected for cooperation. That's his claim. All right, so you have, do you have to go, Warren? Yes, I have a quick question before I, I go. Okay. Uh, for the Freud assignment, I'm gonna have to redo the entire thing. I think so. I think that was the one where I'm just not making sense of this. I'm not following what you want to say. There was one of those where I just absolutely couldn't figure out where you're coming from. Um, if you want to meet with me, though, if you want to just meet about it, yes. and yeah, we can have an office hour. I'll see, I'll see when I when I can, because I mean I wrote four pages on it, so. I to do it. If I have to redo it, I, I'll, I'll just redo it. But or you can just keep moving on because you don't have to have a, a one for every week. You just have to have ten, and there's like thirteen weeks, so you can just move on. You know that. It says it in the syllabus. Oh, Cause my my because I'm here saying because my intention even without looking at the syllabus is I'm going to do everything. Right, Warren. I mean, that, then that's fine. And I understand why. It's just yeah. that if, if you faltered on that one, just move on. It's fine. Because yeah. Freud, you know, what were some of the main points in Freud? You know, daddy, you know, God is the daddy in the sky, or it's all about sex. And then toward the end, he started to think, well, maybe not, maybe we can get over that. Um, you know, Freud was, he was answering the excess optimism of the enlightenment. Yes. I mean, there's, there's stuff in Freud, but, but the main thrust of the class doesn't include Freud so much. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, because when you look at this video, I, I didn't include Freud in the way I was tying it all together. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, just move on. It's not a biggie. No problem. Okay. Not a problem, not a problem. All right, well, let's see. You're gonna have to go. You have to go to work, right? Go to work, I'm actually running a little late. Yeah, okay. I'll be okay. All right, well, uh, see you on listen Friday. to the video. Okay. I will. Okay. And do you, okay, do you promise you'll listen to it before the next class? Yes, I will. Yeah, I will. and then we're going to have a lot more to cover on the reading, Damasio. So, okay. We'll okay see no you. problem. I'll bye see bye. you. Bye.